Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our joining us for Clinintel's first webinar for 2021, putting our MCC and CC capture rates to the test, sponsored by Clinintel. My name is Robin Furlong, and I will be today's moderator. The industry's response to Clinintel's monthly webinar series have been positively, as we have gauged by the numbers of registrants. And we are honored to continue the webinars throughout 2021. We promise to discuss throughout these provoking topics with innovative and cutting edge solutions to age old problems in severity reporting. Before we begin today's program, there are a few housekeeping rules. All of your lines will be muted. If you have any questions for Dr. Govinder during today's webinar, please submit them by using the question section located on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be addressing as many questions that time allows at the end of our presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and we will be emailing the link with all the slides at the end of the show <laughs> to all those who are registered today. Again, I am Robin Furlong, the mo today's moderator. A little bit about myself. I have over 35 years of HIM experience. Majority of my career has been dedicated to working in various acute care hospitals, directing HIM, coding, and CDI departments. I'm looking forward to today's content since capture rates have been used as a key performance metric for many years. I hope you're eager to hear more about its validation and true value to our industry. By now, many of you are already familiar with today's presenter, Dr. Terrence Govinder, the VPMA for ClinIntel. Without any further delay, let me hand it over to Dr. Terrence Govinder. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, and thank you everybody for joining. Robin, you can hear me okay, correct? Yes, sounds Wonderful. very good. Wonderful, so thank you to our audience that have joined us. We have an exciting bit of content to share with you this afternoon, morning, depending on where you are. Uh, Happy New Year. I'm going to ride that wave until we get to February, then you're on your own. But I hope you had a good start to the year. Um, so far, so good. And uh, if applicable and you're in a healthcare organization, then I hope you've managed to get your vaccination done, uh, or, or at least in the waiting line queue. Let me share my screen here to make sure that we're on the same page, Robin. Um, All right, one second, one second. Uh, all right. So, you know how this goes. We don't waste any time. We jump straight into it because we usually have a lot of content. I predict that you're probably going to have some questions today. Uh, this is a very, very interesting topic. It's something that uh, not only I posted on LinkedIn the other day, it gives me heartburn when I talk about, when I hear leaders talking about my capture rates are low, or we've got a certain percentile that we need to meet. We're going to make sense of it all today. So it's, 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 some of the concepts are very, very easy to understand. Some can get a bit more complicated, but I'm going to try and simplify it as much as I can to help you understand how this pertains to what we do today. So you're going to get the slide deck, you're going to get the recording. Um, and up front, I'll tell you that if you watch today's webinar or you're attending right now, and if you feel that there are other individuals, leaders, colleagues, or whoever it is that you think will get value out of it, please don't be shy. Please share it with them and please encourage them to join our future webinars. As I said, we're not taking our foot off the gas. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. So let's dive straight into it. So why, why capture rates? Where does this come from? Well, <laughs> let's call a spade a spade firstly. CDI really probably wouldn't exist if it weren't for the MCCs and CCs. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that's all that CDI is about, because I think that the majority of individuals on this call or the attendees will attest to the fact that we must go beyond just the capture rate. The sad thing is that even though most of us in the industry say that, if you take a deeper dive into your organization uh, or if you work with consultants, the capture rates wear their ugly head every single time. So it really doesn't make sense. So you've seen this slide before. This is one of my favorite slides. It is a slide that we used for CMI, uh, the metric we love to hate. And really what it tells us is that there's two components driving the overall CMI number and a high versus low CMI doesn't necessarily mean you're doing well on or, or poorly on 
severity documentation, capture of CCs and MCCs. I put it in there because really what the industry does in an attempt to isolate the severity component of the CMI or a DRG group, we started, not we, the industry started measuring and monitoring capture rates to the point where you can go uh, to CMS and pull capture rates. You can go to uh, Definitive Healthcare and you'll see your organization's capture rates. But it makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's flawed. Uh, it's not based on statistically sound principles, which you'll soon see. But nonetheless, what we're aiming to do is to shift our patient mix from a lower to a higher severity or more accurate, shall I say, severity level, because that helps us appreciate how we should get reimbursed, the complexity of care, the length of stay, blah, blah, blah. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But these capture rates now are front and center, and they've been used for years to do many things in the industry. Some of these things that I'm talking about include uh, you calculating or vendors or consultants calculating on your behalf uh, the what I call what they call the OFI, the opportunity for improvement. Capture rates are used to monitor or measure impact or return on investment or to measure and monitor performance, whether you're talking about performance of the organization, whether you're talking about performance of a DRG group, or some, in some cases, in some scaled cases, the performance of a clinical documentation specialist aka severity reporting specialist, which is what I like to refer them to, as they're used in all these different departments. Now guys, the bulk of this presentation is not going to be about the different ways that it's being used, because I didn't come up with these ways. The industry uses some of them. There may be ways that I don't bring up here today. It's not because I am uh, negligent, but that's not the topic. The topic is to see where they're being used, call out some flaws or some cautionary measures, and then really put them to the test, which is what we're gonna to do towards the end. So when we dive into opportunity, as I said, there's many different ways it's being used, but essentially what consultants or, or vendors do is they make, measure the average capture rates uh, of you know, DRGs with MCCs or CCs, and they may do this for all discharges, or they may do it for discharges that are just reviewed by the CDI team. Um, which is, in my mind, not a good thing to do because you make yourself or you have an excuse for the fact that we have large severity gaps across our organization because the CDI team or HIM or CDI team doesn't review those charts. You need to move the entire organization towards a specific severity level, a more accurate. And if you just focus your metrics on the charts that you're touching, not only are you not addressing the position component, but you are basically going to make sure your metrics look good and we can check up our box with our leaders. So a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of calling out today. Uh, and I, you know, the, the good thing about this is you always get transparency, you always get uh, candor, as we like to say, clean and tell. So we're gonna call a spade a spade today. So now what they do after that is they'll take the, the average and they'll compare it to perhaps years prior, or they'll choose a cohort. They'll say, here's a similar sized hospital, here's a service line that's uh, aligned with this particular service line, and they'll make the comparison. Sometimes they do it uh, compared to MedPal, all right? And inevitably what happens is they come up with a percentage or a dollar opportunity based on that methodology. Now there's, there's probably 15 different ways that the industry or you've been experiencing this. Let's call it one more. Uh, we compare the CC, MCC capture rates to the MedPAR top decile. Then we can identify now a MedPAR client delta. The industry makes some assumptions. Don't ask me what those assumptions are, but they make some assumption, assumptions to basically understand if there is and what is the relationship between the capture rate and CMI. So essentially, I've seen this before. If the capture rate goes up 1%, you get an incremental increase in CMI by X. Now you figure that out, you can essentially calculate the dollar amount opportunity because you just multiply by the annual discharges and your CMS blended rate. And the attempt after that is to go and validate your calculation or your estimation with chart review. All right, so of course, 
you cannot review, if you've been watching uh, over the months, you cannot review a statistically significant number of charts across a very large organization. Furthermore, um, depends who's reviewing the chart and opportunities can only be identified based on information in the chart. So that's one methodology. So identifying opportunities somehow in shape or form MCC, CC capture rates play a role. So how many of you have seen something like this before put in front of you? They give you a DRG and there's a dollar amount attached next to it. And it's more than likely uh, attributed to MCC, CC capture opportunity. So this makes me very, very upset and frustrated with the industry, not with our, our organization, our healthcare, a few care organization, but with our vendors. Because firstly, I can tell you right now, they're probably benchmarking DRG to DRG. Secondly, some poor leader at the organization now has a bogey on their head to come up with these MCCs or CCs to validate the data that somebody else used, which you'll soon learn is very, very unsophisticated. So there are some challenges and portions that you should always think of. All right, first and foremost, there are variables that influence your capture rate. There are some known variables, there's some unknown variables. Some unknown variables may be uh, things like, you know, what's the scope of your CDI program? What's the size? What's the skill level, etc. You don't just, you don't know any of that based on who you're benchmarking against. And when you're benchmarking, always remember, if you recall our um, webinar on benchmarking, we said you may be benchmarking against a pool of low performers. You'll never know. You may be looking at the best, lowest performer as your hero because you don't have a firm understanding of how they're performing at their organization. In addition to that, you may be benchmarking against somebody that's over-reporting and that's MCCCC driven. All right. And so now they become your, your goal or your benchmark. So always be wary of that. Don't forget, guys, you want to always check your data. I hope the vendors are not putting uh, standalone DRGs in your big mix and saying your capture rates are X and it's below the med part percentile or, or a certain 80 percentile. Why? Because some of them are standalone. Not all of them are triplets. Not some of them are diets. Some of them are triads. And so the problem with the capture rate and measuring against national averages is that you start chasing the MCC or the CC. And in some cases, it's only a two status. So only the MCC counts, as you know. Very frequently that's in surgical cases. So if you're chasing the MCC, now you've got a problem. You can get your MCC and meet the dollar amount on the previous page, and then get dinged on quality in the back end because now you've got an acute condition that was present on admission or during the hospital stay. If it was present on admission, more than likely you wouldn't be performing the, the procedure. So these are just cautionary measures that you need to keep in mind. The problem with chasing the CC and the MCC, as you know, is any CC or MCC counts. They're not telling you that a specific one counts. So it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And if you keep chasing the metric, you're going to lose out on what we're actually supposed to be doing, which is trying to capture the clinical truth. Now, the problem with um, comparing yourself to MedPAR is that there's downgrades and the data is aged, as you know. There may be relative weight changes. Take all of that into consideration. Impact, right? So essentially, oh, this is odd. Um, my animation is all messed up. Anyway, today is full of surprises. The historical capture rate is analyzed and then we compare it to the MedPond national 80 percentile. We've heard this before, you've heard people do it before, it probably was done at your organization at some point in time. There's that relationship again between capture rate and CMI change. Now the consultant will come and say, or the technology vendor will say, well, we came in and here was your capture rate and CMI three. Here's it after we made you whole again. And so they calculate that uh, and that's an ROI. There's some flaws with that as well. There's the part here that I'm talking about capturing the impact from you touching the chart. You reviewed the chart and now you've got an MCC because it's because of you. That's a metric that I see being monitored and measured very frequently. So here's some general cautionary measures about that. The ROI calculations depend heavily on 
uh, baseline performance, meaning it's not very good and effective or reliable when you're trying to calculate impact that you're making for a program that's well run or well maintained. Uh, if you're going and introducing a brand new program, yes, this probably works decently, not great, but decently. But as soon as you go into a high performing uh, organization, this goes out the window, right? It becomes very, very unreliable. And the usual sort of cautionary measures apply here too. We can uh, make sure that you're not ignoring other factors. Remember I said capture rates can be influenced by several variables. So those variables include hiring another cardiothoracic surgeon, surgeon, expanding your service line, a surgical service line, or losing a surgeon, or maybe purchasing a new orthopedic hospital. All of those things need to be taken into consideration. And don't forget about gaming. Okay? Um, what is gaming? Well, we'll learn later on in this, in this uh, meeting or this webinar that when you have a metric that can be manipulated to make it look good, it's problematic. I call it a vanity metric. So some of the software out there is catching or counting the MCC that you got based on answering, getting a query answered. There was probably going to be an MCC or, or CC on that case anyway. Perhaps the physician was waiting for information. Perhaps it was somewhere in the chart and we didn't pick it up. So as long as you are getting that MCC that you queried for, it gets counted in your favor. So when you dive into the data, make sure that you're not falling victim to that as well. Let me say a little bit about physician engagement and, and capture rates. Guys, I don't have to tell you. Capture rates are not going to help the physician. Most of us don't know what a CC and an MCC is unless they've been force fed that information by consultants. But in general, they don't pay attention to it because it doesn't appear, uh, appeal to their clinical acumen. So it doesn't help you uh, or help your case to engage physicians or adopt a holistic approach that actually um, addresses the physician needs in optimizing severity reporting. We're gonna do our poll now, guys, and uh, let me launch this poll very quickly. All right, so essentially it's asking you, what are you using it for, right? Um, I'm getting some great, great particip participation. Okay. Okay, I'll give it five more seconds, four, three, two, and one. I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share. Uh, can you see the, the poll questions, Robin? Yes. Everything looks good. Okay. So, guys, uh, the results... Um, okay, perfect. The results show that 51% of us are measuring, are using it for impact, right? Um, and, and, I, and that's a broad um, sort of uh, category, but that's very, very telling about how we're using this because you, are, you identified or you, you heard this far that it's problematic because there's different cautionary measures you need to take. And impact could be, hey, the CFO wants to know what value are you to the organization. So we have to measure every single time the CDI touches the chart and, and shifts the, the MC, shifts the DRG. So I'm not surprised that impact takes the cake here. Followed by performance, all right? It may be DRG, organizational, or even CDS performance. And then opportunity, very close third. Uh, about 5% of us are saying none of the above. I'd love to see or hear from you what you are actually using or monitoring to, to isolate the severity component of CMI because as you know, the CMI can bounce around without having uh, and without it being an indication of severity documentation. So let me hide here and let's dive straight into it again. Robin, if you can see my screen again. Yes. Well, I see the poll question. Oh, okay. now I see probabilities. All okay. right. So guys, <laughs> I am not a statistician or a mathematician, but you know what I have? I have a Wi-Fi connection. So the stuff that I'm going to discuss today is very, very important and very, very applicable to what we do with capture rates, all right? 
it's not rocket science, but if you don't make an effort to actually find out more about it uh, and just take things as they're given to us, you'll never actually just stumble on this uh, in your day-to-day -day work. So one of the important concepts is probability. When you're trying to figure out what is the probability, you're trying to predict the outcome, probability becomes very, very important to understand. Now, if you understand probability, uh, you'll run across or you'll stumble upon the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers really allows us to uh, appreciate how insurance companies know how much to charge you in premiums or uh, who's going to be, who's going to fare in a certain way in an election or perhaps, um, you know, what's the next best thing to come based on research and feedback. It's called the law of numbers and it has to do with probability. And it's a powerful principle. It's not that difficult to understand, but it's a very important concept as you'll soon see. So when you look at probability, it can be really laid out in, uh, in sort of two types, if you will, I'll call it types. So you can have what we'll call um, theoretical probability. So if I said to you, I had a coin, it's a normal coin. It's not weighted in one way versus the other. It's a solid, good, decent coin. And if I said to you, what's the probability of me getting heads or tails if I flip it? I hope that many of you are thinking it's a 50-50 chance, two-sided coin, right? Um, not weighting one side versus the other. See, that would be the theoretical probability, meaning we know that if you flip a coin, you've got a 50-50 chance. There's a second kind of probability called the experimental probability. What is that? That is if you actually put it to the test. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to take a coin, a decent coin, and I'm going to start flipping it. If I flip it the first time, right, what are we expecting to get? Well, it could be a 50-50 chance, as you can see under theoretical probability. So I flip it the first time, I get tails. Great, wrong already. I flip it the second time, I get tails again. What if I flip it the third time? Ooh, look at that, three tails in a row. Well, let's go for number four. Four tails in a row with a 50-50 uh, probability uh, for, the, for the coin being heads or tails doesn't really line up, does it? Doesn't really uh, line up with your theoretical probability. So this allows me now to actually talk about what they, what they call gambler's fallacy. So <laughs> the casinos win because the gambler's fallacy is that the probability of the next one being heads is so likely now because we've had four tails in a row. Well, guys, every single flip is independent of any other flip that occurred before it. So you can put a lot of money on heads and get lucky for the next one, but you still have a 50-50 uh, chance. So if you're reviewing five DRG charts and you haven't found anything, the probability of you finding one in the next DRG category is just as good as it was in the five before. Okay, so that's gambler's fallacy. So the problem is each flip of the coin here is not tying up with your theoretical probability. Theoretically, you should see two heads and two tails. That's a 50-50, but you're seeing four tails in a row. So that doesn't mean that anything is wrong. Uh, it's just that those four flips they're only relevant when you take into consideration a huge number of flips, right? So on its own, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't prove or disprove your theoretical probability of the coin having a 50-50 chance or 50% chance of being heads. So early on in your experiment or in your what we'll call flips, your outcome may not match your theoretical. It's only when you start doing it indefinitely or a large number of times. In other words, as the number of experiments increases, now the actual or the observed probability will start to approach that 50%. It's not necessarily gonna happen in the first five flips or even 10 flips, all right? But that's important, everyone, why? Because that allows us to predict and really have some confidence 
as to how events or certain events will play out in the long run. So very, very interesting, very, very easy topic to wrap your minds around. So what now? What do we do with that? Well, let's put it to the test in the sense that let's track what we're doing if I flip a coin several times. So we said that a coin has a 50-50 chance. What I'm trying to uh, prove is that the cumulative proportion of heads, what will it be over time? It should be 0.5, right? 50%. Meaning if I flip it 10,000 times, and if I take the average of heads and average of tails, I should be, or, or 10 million times, I should be approaching 50-50. So here, here's what happens. I, I flip it the first time and I get tails. That's a zero out of one flip. I flip it the second time, I get tails. That's a zero out of two flips. I flip it the third time, sorry, the fourth time. Now the third time, <laughs> sorry guys, the third time. Now I've still got tails again, no heads yet, right? Three flips, zero heads, zero out of three. Flip it the fourth time, ooh, I've got heads, finally, right? What's the cumulative pro proportion? It's one head divided by four flips, 25%. Now, ooh, I've got another head, Pop, fantastic. Now I've got two flips out of, sorry, two heads out of five flips. Do the math, two divided by five. On the sixth flip, I finally hit another head and that brings me up to that probability, that theoretical probability. But do you see how the first three flips, the, the first four, and even the, the, the fifth one wasn't, uh, wasn't near it, right? But the theoretical probability may not necessarily occur either early on or in a subset of your uh, experiment. But if I continue to flip it, let's continue to flip over time. You see what happens? The more you flip, the closer it gets over time to your theoretical probability. But if I just looked at this entire graph now, and I went to the first, to the, to the first three flips and I analyzed those three flips, that's not, that's not good insight as to what the theoretical probability is, right? So how does it apply to capture rates? Well, if someone is saying your capture rates are low and you're trying to validate it, perhaps by chart review, whatever the case may be, you may be getting something where you're above the theoretical probability. You may be getting something very far away. You may be getting something spot on, right? You have no idea. And you'll never be able to review a statistically significant number of charts to prove your theory. It's just, it's just asinine that we do that. We make a calculation and then we say it has to be supported by chart review. Well, first of all, it's a statistical analysis that you're doing and you're trying to sort of justify it based on the actual or, or one or two or 10 charts. So that's an easy concept, but here's the principle behind it, the law of large numbers. What it does, it gives us kind of a direction or a compass, um, and we can use that to navigate the randomness around us in this world, right? So even though you'll never be able to predict the outcome of the one coin flip, so when I was on number two there, I had no idea it was 50-50. I couldn't be certain it was going to be heads or tails. It was 50-50. Even though you can't predict that one, but here's the important thing, and I'm going to say this again later on, very, very important point to take home in CDI, Severity reporting HIM world. The law of large numbers, while you can't predict the outcome of that one flip, but there is an idea or it supports the idea that if you stick to your guns and if you implement a strategy that's well founded and well directed, and if you follow it through and if you're consistent over time, you'll get where you need to go even though you may have some negative results here and there along the way. But over time, you're going to get in line with your theoretical probability. Very, very important point. Remember, we're going to put it to the test here in a bit. So, you know, I had uh, a conversation not so long ago with a VP from a very large health system. And some of, the, some of them might be from that health system on this call. 
and they wanted to do an analysis. So we ran a statistical analysis of their data, showed them where the opportunity is. And the, the VP cons insisted on me telling her which DRG is driving the opportunity. The reason why she was so hung up on that is because she wanted to go back and send her team out to review charts in that DRG category to see if the analysis was correct. Do you see how crazy that is? Because yeah, you may find something here, you may not. You may find all the documentation. But you can't sort of tie the two together, right? It's, it's, it'll make more sense here when we, when we put it to the test, but it's a very, very different story to try and validate in that way. I don't blame her because it's what the industry has sort of trained her to do over time. It's flawed. And I always say that we, we're less likely to question things that we've been doing for a long period of time. So guys, let's put it to the test. Let's do a simulation model. What is a simulation model? Well, we're going to sort of have some knowns and we're gonna roll the dice. What does that mean? Well, there's different ways, and you can't control this, that you can get to an average number of capture rates for, let's just say, uh, a period of time. If the average for volume for the month or for, the, for two years is uh, 10,000, you appreciate that depending on the two years, you can still get to 10,000, but each month may have a different volume. When you do the average, uh, you'll still get to 10,000. So we have some knowns, which is we know the share of the total DRG volume, right? We know the DRG, which is simple pneumonia. So we're going to take the simple pneumonia, and it's a common DRG. It's one that many of us are familiar with. We're going to pick a known entity to clientele, one of our clients. You won't know who it is, but it's a very, very large academic medical center, and they have upwards of 5,000 discharges a month. We're going to measure over a course of two years the simple pneumonia DRG month to month to month. We also know for that time period what percentage of that simple pneumonia DRG was reported without a CC or MCC, with an MCC or with a CC. We know exactly, that's a fixed number for the two years that we're going to look at. But rolling the dice means you can have different scenarios with volume month to month. You know, in that first scenario, you've got X number of discharges uh, that are pneumonia. And in the second scenario, maybe you had more in June and less in July, but you can still come to the average at the end. I hope this is resonating with you. So what does roll the dice mean? Well, roll the dice means we're going to give you a simulation model. Uh, so I'm going to bring up here. Hopefully you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks. I see the graph. All right, wonderful. So guys, what you're looking at here are that pneumonia DRG, right? The volume is on the top graph here, month to month to month to month. If I calculate the average, I'll get a certain number. The bottom one, as you can see, it's color coded, is telling you what share of the overall volume was reported with a CC or with an MCC. So essentially, you can measure now the CC, MCC capture rate for this DRG. Now, this is a very high volume DRG. It's very common. This is a large academic medical center. The reason why I picked it or why we picked it is because um, less, less chance of you having a sample size issue, all right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna roll the dice. Every time I hit F9 on this spreadsheet, the simulation model is going to juggle the volume Left, you know, you're going to get the same average of capture rates for the entire two years that's displayed on, on that um, graph. You're going to have the same number of discharges for the two years, but you're going to have different scenarios from month to month. That's called a simulation model or, or rolling the dice, so to speak. Uh, coming up to the same answer of capture rate being 60%, whatever it is, for this one DRG, you're coming up to the same answer on the back end with regards to number of discharges with pneumonia as the principal, but it's different scenarios, same overall number. Let's go for it. I'll hit F9 and it'll take a couple seconds and then 
See how that changed? So look at January and look at February. Look at the volume there. It's 40 and 51 of the graph up, up above. I'm going to hit F9. And it should change. See how that volume changes? Month to month, the volume can change. Month to month, the capture weight can change. See in the bottom now? Look at the capture weight. Look at Jam, Fair, March, whichever you want to focus on. It's all giving you different scenarios. Look at that. Wow. That's a huge difference. But guess what, guys? When you measure the capture weight for the two years of data on your screen, you're going to get the same number. But on a month-to-month -month variation or basis, see how it changes. It changes a lot, all right? Look at that. And I can do this all day. This is like a toy for me. Uh, Eric created this for me, and I think it's fantastic. I hardly slept last night for those things so much. Um, but it's really, really... Wait, Terrence. You're, you're what, Karen? Can you hear me? So, I've seen vendors tell you. Yes. Yeah, we're, your audio was going out a little. Yep. Okay, can we can you? hear you better. It was echoing. Okay, thank you. Are you now? Okay. Sorry about that, guys. What happened there? Um, what I was saying was, this is very interesting because when a vendor puts in front of you that your capture rates are low for a month or even a quarter, what are you supposed to do with that? It's called variation. You're going to get variation. All right. The bottom line is, if I take the average capture rate for this DRG, CC and MCC, for that two-year period, it comes out to about 85, 86 percent. That means if I take the average of every single month, is there a month where I'm below 86? Yeah. Is there a month where I'm high above? Yeah. What is it depending on? Several things, including who walked through the door at what time. Let's do an F9 again because we can. So let's calculate down here. And let's see what comes up. It takes a while. Wait, Taryn? There's a lot of data in behind this spreadsheet. And so okay. it's going to give you, it's going to roll the dice again. It's going to give you different volumes, but guess what? The exact same result with regards to the average capture rate and number of discharges. Go on again. All right. So, guys, Robin, just interrupt me if my, uh, if my uh, sound's off. Yeah, you're, you're, you're cutting out All right. intermittently. Can you hear me, Robin? Now I can. Yes. I don't know what's causing that microphone issue. Huh. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think what it is, I think it's the I think it's the uh, the Excel spreadsheet. It's doing such a big calculation in the back every time I press F9 okay. that it might be uh, affecting it. Anyway, guys, let's look at this. this. This is exactly like that graph that I showed you with the coin flip, where we had tails, 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 heads, 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 and over time we're getting to where we need to be, which is the 50%. So, what's the average for this facility for the two years for the capture rate? It is about 86%. Which you can see eventually over time there, you get to that 86%. This is for them now. It's not the it's not where they should be, but it's for them. It's what they've done, it's the actual observed probability that we're seeing over two years. Uh, what we'd like to know is where they should be, which is the magic that Clinical does. But if you just look at this graph, you see how long it takes before it gets to that 86-ish type line, right? At the very, very beginning, in January, if you look at January, you'll say, man, we're killing it. We're rock stars in pneumonia DRGs. And then when you look at February, you're like, uh-oh, do we need to hire staff? Do we need to spank our CDSs because they're not capturing the CCs or MCCs for pneumonia? And then it goes even down further. So you've got one, two, three, four data points. It's just going downhill. You cannot react to that. Why? Because over the long run, look where you end up. Now let's press F9 again. I'm not going to say anything because that might sh uh, shut off the volume. But let's press F9 again, right? It's doing the exact same thing, but now it's calculating the cumulative total for each data point.
Give it a second. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Look at this, guys. See how different this is? We're still ending up at the 60% over the two years, two years worth the DRGs. But see what the beginning looks like. See that what the few, what the coin tosses look like at the beginning. So what else is important to take from this? You're getting to that 86 that's going to be for them over time. But I can't go and look at the first quarter of that year and make a decision based on that or the second quarter of that year. What's better for me to do is to implement a strategy and be consistent with it if I want to impact this metric. But we're too reactive to the vendors putting in front of us, your capital rates are low for January in DRG group 456 with a volume of eight. Guys, it is noise, all right? And if you're a vendor out there and you're listening to this, just stop doing it because hospitals are paying ridiculous kinds of money to be fed noise. And you cannot make decisions based on this. I get heated about it because I, I speak to, 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 pros, to hospitals and I don't even want to know what they're paying for such reports that's, that's highlighting a capture rate that's less than the national average for that DRG group for February. So see how it tanks. What's more important, see how many months it takes you, almost a full year, Jan to December, before you start getting to that probability, right? Almost a full year. You can't do it in one month. You can't do it in three months. You've got to do a lot of coin tosses. And I'm saying coin tosses, but you know what I mean. This is every single DRG volume from the simple pneumonia, and it's measuring the capture rate cumulative over time. See how long it takes you to get there. I'm going to do this one more time, and we're going to move on and talk about some other things here as well. One last time, let's see what we get this time, all right? What we get is a frozen computer. Uh, so let me go back here, Robin, and let me bring. This up here. All right. I'm going to share that again. Sorry, guys. It's just that I think that with the. Uh, Massive amount of data and go to meeting, which hasn't been behaving very well lately. Um, okay, we're seeing you your see screen here. again. It's back to All the right, slide deck. So, guys, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you look at capture rates, and you've heard me say this in the past, you're going to get at the DRG group level, you're going to get hammered on the sample size, right? There's just not enough sample size. Now, try doing that at the position level. Okay, where the sample size is even lower at the DRG group level. So what are we going to do now? Well, we have to figure out what the impact is of what they what they find in the uh, capture rates. Well, you're trying to measure impact or trying to measure opportunity rather instead. What do they do? They take your capture rate, maybe at the DRG level or whatever level, and they're going to compare it to the 80th percentile in MedPAR. Now, the data you looked at, was all payer data. But this, this just drives my point home. Let's just say we compare their simple pneumonia, let's just say their Medicare simple pneumonia capture rate was 86%. It was all payer, but I'm trying to make a point. If their Medicare capture rate was 86%, and now we looked at the national data capture rate, where's 86% on here? Do you see it? It's down here. It's on the left-hand side of the curve. So there's a possibility now that the consultant or the vendor is going to tell them, no, you need to be at 80th percentile, right? You need to go that way. But you see how misleading that can be, right? It's the capture rates are dependent on several things. And here's what's even more concerning is that the capture rates are not the same for every single organization. Why am I saying that? And why do I know that you inherently know this as well? When you do benchmarking, you don't compare yourself if you're a trauma level three 
to a community hospital. We just don't do that. We look for similar bed size, similar service lines, academic medical centers. Why do we do that? Because we're trying to make it as apples as apples as possible, even though there's no cohort for, sorry, no proxy for your unique DRG mix, but that's why we do that. But I can tell you, what if I told you that the pneumonia patient that walks into Tampa General Hospital, which is an academic medical center, is actually very different or could be different to the pneumonia patient that walks into the academic medical center in, at Stanford. That's a fact. It's very different. So how are you controlling for that? So you see why not only is benchmarking poor, but when you take your capture rates and now put it on the national percentile based on MedPAR age data that potentially has weight changes and downgrades in it, it's, it's very unreliable but we hang our hats on that anyway. So I'll say it again. The principle, the law of large numbers, it supports a concept or it supports the idea that if you have a well-rounded, well-founded strategy that it, and if you follow it consistently over time, you should win or you should get to your uh, theoretical probability for your organization. The trick is knowing what it should be or what it should be for your organization not based on the uh, uh, med part data or national averages. So what, what am I trying to get at everybody? I'm trying to get at to my main point, which is don't manage the metric, manage the system. That may not mean much to you just now, but I'll, I'll expound a little bit further. So I'm gonna share with you here what many would call their weight loss journey. This is my, my data, but I refer to it as my uh, fitness goal or fitness journey because the goal wasn't to drop pounds the goal was to get fit again and I can drop pounds my capture weights and not be fit right but if I'm set on the scale every day as you can see here which is what I did um, it's going to track my weight day to day is it going to be a flat line no it goes up it goes down. Let's look at it for a month. See how it goes up and down, guys? That's just what it does. Now, what if I reacted to one of those points when it was high up? I starved myself until I got it back down again. You cannot react to that. It's noise. What you want to go for is this. Over time, you want to look at your data. You don't want to go and react to monthly or quarterly capture rates or CMI or whatever the case may be. Right. First of all, the metric itself is flawed, as you just saw, but you cannot react to this. You need to manage the system. So how do you manage the system? Well, historically, this is what our severity reporting initiatives look like. Historically, it's changing very quickly, but it was very HIM, CDI heavy. Minimal participation from the physicians. Let's focus on the physicians. If you manage the system, you need to move to a model like this where the system involves several components in your organization. You've seen the slide before if you follow us, but essentially we cannot make our clinical documentation specialists more efficient and just focus on that, make them more efficient at generating queries, but there's no guarantee your query is going to get answered, or there's no uh, approach where you're teaching the man how to fish versus giving him a fish, which is giving the physician the data to say this is where you're falling short and here's the impact that you falling short is having on your own metrics or the organization's metrics so managing the system doesn't mean being reactive to month to month or quarterly capture rates because if you're just looking for capture rates you've seen this before as well only seven percent of all the diagnosis codes are just cc's and mcc's only 6% are all of the above, and 51% absolutely no value. But this is very insightful, because if you react to the CC and the MCC to make your metric look good, you're missing out on a lot of true severity reporting at your organization. Let me show you what managing the system looks like. So somebody brought this to me and they said, hey, Terrence, we have these TAVAs, right? We're doing these TAVAs at our organization, and um, we looked at the national data, and which is what you see here. I, it's dumbed it down a little bit, so it's not exactly the same, but it's three years worth of data. 
three years, good healthy sample size of the TAVA split, 266267. And when you look at the bottom there, you'll see that there's a grand total of MCC volume of 3,300. The hospital in concern, that's concerned is only at 1,228. And then they're lower than average for several things, right? They're lower on average for um, no MCC, right? They, uh, sorry, they're higher on average for that, meaning they're reporting more cases uh, without CCs, sorry, without MCCs than the average that you see across all of these academic medical centers. And so they're saying, you know, what's going on? What's the MCC that we're missing? You see, that's not managing the system. That's managing the metric. So what do you do in a case like this, right? Well, the CC, MCC capture rate does nothing for you, even if you want to measure, measure it, okay? It, it will do absolutely nothing for you because it doesn't help you fix the problem. In fact, you may run into a bigger problem. Why? Because you may have a case where you're chasing the MCC and you may end up with a PSI, right? So the trick is not to chase the MCC, that's managing the metric. The trick is to look for actionable data. So the actionable data, and well, this is some AMC, let's do Stanford because there are 10,000 discharges. And this is Medicare data, right? And, and this, it wasn't Stanford that brought this to me, but I'm just giving you an example. So this is Medicare data. And what you want to do is you want to look for actionable data where there's uh, significant gaps in clinical conditions. And if there's a condition that has gaps, let's just say it's acute heart failure. Um, this thing is really, go to webinar is really messing me around, Robin. Um, okay, so look at this, this is funny, right? Stanford, highest opportunity in severity reporting or to improve is cardiothoracic surgery, which by the way is more than likely where those tabs are falling. I'm just giving you a situation as to how to manage the metric, I'm sorry, how to manage the system. So I'm not gonna go searching for MCCs and CCs, right? What I'm gonna do is look for clinical condition performance gaps based on analyzing their patient mix. Do you see what's coming up there? The top three, acute heart failure, specified shock and acute respiratory failure, significant gaps. So they happen to be MCCs, but I'm not going to chase it. What I'm gonna instead do is to get the surgeons together and help them appreciate when can we say acute heart failure? If the patient goes into failure intraoperatively, does it count? Can we get the anesthetist on board or the anesthesiologist? All right, so the trick is to focus on the conditions that have gaps. Your MCC, and you've, you've, you've probably said this yourself, you've heard many people say, the trick is not to uh, chase the money, take care of the documentation and the money will come. And that's absolutely true. However, we go back and we measure the MCC and CC capture rates because that's what the industry does. So guys, this is just an example of managing the system. If you manage the system, if I reacted to my, my BMI or my weight, okay, it's, it's what I refer to as a vanity metric because it doesn't help me make any changes. So your low capture rates based on national averages it's just that, it's a low capture rate. Right? What do you do about it and well, how do you fix it long term? So once again, the law of large numbers is gonna give you that compass. So you can navigate the randomness around us. So you don't wanna go fix one chart, you should, but that shouldn't be your strategy. Your strategy should be addressing the physicians, addressing the department, helping them understand why you have gaps. Because I can pull up another AMC right now and I can tell you that they're just hitting acute heart failure in that city surge wall like you wouldn't believe. What are these guys not doing? That's managing the system, all right? You can make the uh, CDSs more efficient at generating queries. There's a role for that. There's value in that, but it shouldn't be your strategy because those queries are not guaranteed to get answered. So what is a vanity metric? Well, guys, maybe some of you will agree with me I know I get very heated with this topic because I know it's, it's, it's rife in the industry. And I wasn't picking on a certain VP that I spoke to at a large organization. It's not her fault. This is not a personal attack on you if you are monitoring this metric. But it is an attack on the vendors out there because we should know better, right? So what happens is because the capture rates are there, it becomes a shiny object. Any question you ask pertaining to CDI, we're going to default to capture rates. Our CMI is down. Oh, guess what? Capture rates are down for this month. 
of this quarter, and so is her surgical percentage. That's why your CMI is down. <laughs> you appreciate that it depends on which month you look at, right? That capture rate could have been up even with the CMI going down. But our vendors are pushing this because they, that's all they have access to. So when I watch sports and somebody doesn't do well, I blame them because that's their job. They need to do well. Okay, I totally get it. They should, they should do way better than I would, right? Um, that's how it is in our industry. We can't blame the healthcare organizations because they've been fed this for the longest time. But as vendors, we need to know better. We have a responsibility to steer healthcare organizations in the right direction with right sound principles. So a vanity metric may make you look good, but offers no value, zero value, right? Zero sustainable value. My capture rates are good, great. How's your um, mortality scores, right? I'm just giving you a, a random example. It can be a good leading indicator, but just be cautious because it can be manipulated. You can tweak it to make yourself look good. The vendor can tweak it to make them look good on your behalf. And vanity metrics are not actionable data. The difference between vanity metrics and actionable data is value, right? So you can make the MCC capture rates look good, but have you shipped the needle for acute heart failure for the specialty group or for the organization? And what you should be doing is investing your time in metrics that help you make good decisions. So guys, we're coming towards the end here. So I want to end with a story. It's a story about a little boy that used to visit his granddad every single day on his way home from school. Every day, I'll go visit his granddad. There's a dog, granddad has a dog. It's sitting on the porch and it's moaning constantly. Just moaning and groaning, just sitting on the porch every single day. Eventually, the little boy got annoyed enough to say, Granddad, why is this dog constantly moaning? Granddad says, well, he's sitting on a nail. That's why the dog's sitting in the same spot every day. So the boy says, well, why doesn't the dog just move? And granddad says, well, it's annoying him, but it's not annoying him that much, right? Many of you on this call have the power or are leaders to actually make a change and to question things because you, you know better, right? But we may not do it because it annoys us, but it doesn't annoy us that much to really make a long lasting change. Many of you on the call are thinking, I don't have that power to go and talk to my leaders about changing things. Well, you don't have the power to do that, but perhaps you have the power to educate. So I hope that this was insightful for you. I'm gonna stop there. Robin, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. The first one is, um, should we stop sharing capture rates with our physicians? Ah, yeah, no. Um, don't do that because your capture rates mean nothing at the physician level, right? Sample size um, or even what, what, what influences the capture rates. The patient mix, the DRG mix, and the DRG mix is not the same for two physicians every month even if they're in the same specialty, it can vary significantly. So don't do that. It's not actionable, right? Physician can't take that and say, oh, I'm gonna just start wearing CCs and MCCs. No, it doesn't help. Stop it, just stop it. <laughs> okay, the second question, what metric should we use? That's a very good question. Well, it's not fair for me to come and just call out stuff from these WebExes without giving you a solution. A clinic told me how a metric that beats capture rates every single time because we don't throw away a single claim. It isolates the severity component of the CMI for you and it projects it onto a CMI scale unique to your organization. And you remember that tail end, 86% that we got over time with the capture rates, how long it took us to get there? With the clinical severity CMI metric, you get that out the gate on day one. You have a firm idea. So we have a better metric. Um, some of our clients may be on this call and you use it. It's straight math, right? But many people haven't figured out how to do the math. But that's what I would suggest, severity CMI. It's the only superior metric in that space. Okay, the, other, the third question. How do we know what the capture rate should be if we don't compare it to national averages? That's a very, not a very good question. Well, what's your expected probability? We know what your theoretical is, meaning we can measure it over two years or whatever the case may be. 
But how do we know what it should be for you? Well, number one, you've got to remove the concept of benchmarking. Number two, you have to leverage advanced analytics. You need to be able to control for the things that are impacting your, uh, your severity reporting. And that's what you know, clinical trials algorithms do. But if that's the only thing you have to do, you, you're more than welcome to continue doing it, but just know that you've got to be cautious of certain flaws that we discussed. Okay. Well, thanks again, Dr. Govinder, for this insightful presentation. This is all the time that we have left for today. We do wanna invite everyone to join us again on February 18th, when we now approach the setting the severity reporting goals for 2021. Yes, we look forward to it. Thank you everybody for joining. Yes. We will be getting these slides. Um, if anyone is, is, is confused about what I said, because there were some con uh, difficult concepts, perhaps reach out to me, Terrence at um, mm -hmm. dot com. I'm more than happy to meet with you and we can discuss it but it's important to grasp these uh, basic concepts in order to uh, understand the data that we're looking at. Have a good rest of the week, everybody. Robin, as always, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. you. It was wonderful. Thank we'll you. We'll see you on February 18th, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.